Hi guys, today I would love to introduce you to an awesome person, an awesome business freelancer or a business writing freelancer that I had the pleasure of connecting with about a year and a half ago for the first time. And we've been able to kind of, you know, connect and, and, and follow along with each other virtually over the last year and a half and it's been so much fun. Now her name is Shannon Watson, she's here with me now. Welcome Shannon. Hi, thanks, this is fun, this is my first time doing one of these. Awesome. So cool. And the reason that I wanted to, you know, grab Shannon for a call today was because she had like a shockingly fast start. She was one of these people that was like, you know, I, I remember having an email from her saying, you know, this would be cool. I'm going to get this up and running. And the next thing it's like, she's got clients coming in left, right and center. And I'm like, how did that happen? Like one minute she's at the starting blocks and one minute she's over here, which was amazing. Um, but not only that, not only the fast start, because I'm always curious, you know, you don't have to get a fast start, but I'm always curious what people do um, when that happens for them, because that can happen for various reasons. Um, but not only getting that fast start, but also how she was able to level up very rapidly as well and really progress with the type of clients she was bringing on board, with the rate she was able to command, with the volume of work she was bringing in. So not only that fast start, but that real... Um, growth early on, even as she was a newbie as well. So those are the reasons that I kind of wanted to really be able to chat with her one-on-one -on -one today and get some insight into that, that you might be able to apply to your freelance career as well. But just before I hand over to Shannon, the other reason that I really wanted to chat with her is because she has, she is a freelancer that's chosen to really go all in on a particular service, a particular skill, a strength that she has, which is writing. And a lot of the times, you know, when I'm talking to people that are new to getting their online career started, and if you've watched any other videos or, you know, blog posts that I've written, you'll hear me sharing about, you know, offering that well-rounded skill set um, so that as a newbie, when you're getting started, you can be saying yes, yes, yes to various projects, positioning yourself as that go-to person rather than a, um, you know, a project to project freelancer in order to be able to ramp up to that, you know, vo volume of work and that income level you need early on. And then as your rate starts to increase, you can start to specialize. But Shannon was a little bit different in that she went all in on this particular service very, like right at the beginning of her career, doing writing predominantly, um, here and there helping with other things. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. But she was able to do that in my observations because she not only had that skill that she was offering, but she was also at the same time positioning herself as that go-to person, that person that has the client's back, that you know is willing to be on team. Even though she's running her own show, the way that she communicates, the way that she positions herself very much has her clients perceiving her like she's the go-to person. And so she was able to really ramp up her work volume as a newbie, she's not a newbie now, but I'm talking about when she started her career, which is what I want to ask her about in a moment, even just offering this one predominant service um, writing. So let's talk more about that because if, if you're coming into this and you're thinking, well, this is great, VA works great, online marketing support is great, but I'd really like to go all in on writing or I'd really like to go all in on design or all in on just landing pages or whatever it might be. Um, see what tips, what clues you can kind of get from the way Shannon approaches her client work overall. So with that type of context and, and why I wanted to speak with Shannon, let me hand it over to you, Shannon, because I'd really like to find out, first off, let's talk about how you got started. Like, what made you want to get into doing this, working on a freelance basis? Why did you go in all in on writing? How did you get your start? How did you get those first clients, you know, back? You know, you tell me when it was. I think it was January 2015, but I'll let you share. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's when I got started. And the how was followed by the why, or actually was preceded by the why. The reason was my husband had been laid off from his job back in August of 2014. And he, he's a web developer, social media director, and he always thought, no problem, I'm going to hang out a shingle for myself. You know, I've got this, you know, 20 year career, I know what I do. You know, I'm an expert, I did this work for you know, a major corporation, I'm going to be great. And it didn't pan out the way either of us thought it would. He found it really hard in the market the way that it was in 2014 to be able to make enough money to support the family as a, as a solo guy, which was really shocking to both of us. Um, he, he really found that he, he was competing with 
um, people in Pakistan and other parts that would work for $3 an hour, which he's not going to work for $3 an hour, you know, living in America, we can't do that. Um, or people wanted like glitzy, shiny agencies and he was neither. So we really were kind of looking at our whole financial picture and saying, well, what are we going to do? Um, so about January, I started thinking, you know, there should be something I can do to help. And, you know, I'm a homeschool mom. I've got four kids at home. And I thought, well, I'm not going to go out and flip burgers. I've, you know, I've got a college degree. There's got to be something I can do that's going to help me help him, you know, make ends meet without taking me too far away from what my core responsibilities are. So I don't remember the exact order of events. I think I found your course first. And it was just the freebie, I think, that I had taken. And it mentioned Elance. I'm like, okay, let's see what that's all about. And I jumped on, created a profile. Well, what's out there? And I think I found something that was asking for a review of some kind. I think it was a review of financial services. I'm like, I can do that. So I went out there and did that. And I'd always had friends tell me, oh my gosh, you're such a great writer. You should write a book. I'm like, I don't want to write a book. Um, but I thought, well, you know, I can string words together. I'm an avid reader. So it helps me, you know, good grammar, all of that stuff, kind of a grammar Nazi, but that's another story. That's uh, awesome. So just to pause there for a second. So what you're saying is like, you weren't quote unquote, a writer in a past off, you know, offline work history. You were kind of coming into this going, okay, it's kind of my strength. I've got good grammar or what have you, but you weren't coming into this saying, I'm a writer and I'm going to do it online now. No, heavens no. My, my degrees, I've got, uh, I triple majored in Spanish psychology and secondary education. So if anything, I would be teaching. Okay. But I can't teach other people's kids very easily and still be at home to teach my own. So yeah, it really was kind of reinventing myself because I didn't have any background whatsoever. I, or so I thought I didn't have a background in writing. But as I started trying to create this, this online persona of Shannon the writer, I thought, well, what do I have that I can leverage? Um, what I really find is a lot of those initial days and even later, it's really about how you spin things. Honestly, of course, I didn't lie about anything that I could do, but I thought, well, what do I have that I could point to to say, yes, I'm qualified to do this. So one of the things that I had was just for fun, I had been doing a lot of reviews on TripAdvisor. And so that was one of the things that I did is I posted a, a link to one of my review pages and I said, I've written, I don't remember what it was at the time, I think it was 56 reviews and I've had 20,000 page views, you know, just to put numbers out there to be like, hey, look, 20,000, that's a big number. It's sort of meaningless, but it was something that I could point to to say, here's a sample of my writing, here's a sample of the impact that I've made take a look. Um, and I've had a few things published in like a church magazine, or I had like little excerpts of things in a book here and there. So it was just stuff that I could put out there to tell people, here's why you can trust that I know what I'm doing. And I think for most people who are beginning, that's their toughest thing is I think they look at themselves and they go, well, there's nothing I can do. You know, you have a lot of what I've seen in, in our group is a lot of people who, you know, maybe they've been home with the kids and they look at their life and say, well, there's nothing I know how to do. Um, one of the people I said to them, you can't tell me you've done nothing for the last 10 years. Look at what you do. Where do you spend your time? Are you on Facebook? You could be a Facebook expert. You know, do you, are you an Instagram fanatic? I bet you have skills there that someone does not have. I don't have Instagram skills. So I think it's really just a matter of kind of um, being optimistic with your own experience and saying, you know what, this may not seem like a big deal to me because it's something that comes naturally, but there may be someone out there for whom this does not come naturally and they may be willing to pay for my time. Oh so. my gosh, that's so true. That is so true. And I think, you know, it was a really big clue there when you said, you know, of that mindset you're in of like, oh, you know, you're looking at, you know, what this person's requesting and you're thinking, oh, I could do that. You know, having that, not like, you know, I'm an expert, I'm going to come in here and, you know, transform this person's business, but that real, you know, just that presence and that sense of confidence in yourself. Yeah, I could do that. You know, at the outset, when you're starting off, that is such a huge part, I feel, of what you're sharing there. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things that I realized and sometimes I have to remind myself of is people aren't really looking for perfection. We may be expecting it of ourselves, but if you can do good enough, sometimes for people good enough is better than anything they can do, or it would take them 10 hours to do what it would take you to do in five. I found that my clients are much more forgiving than I am of myself. You know, I'll go back and I'll find that like I had a double space instead of a single space or, you know, a period that wasn't quite where it should be. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, seriously, Shannon, don't worry about it. It's all good. So yes. I think just being it's good to have those high standards, though. But yeah, like you said, 
Yeah, I, I think, yeah, just getting started and being brave enough to take a step and seeing what you can put yourself out there for, that's probably the biggest hurdle. And that's where I see a lot of people stopping is they, they just aren't brave enough to, to put that profile up or to apply for that job or to keep applying for jobs. Because quite honestly, when you're getting started and you don't have a lot to point to, it can be hard because you don't have that track record. You don't have that history so that someone can look at and go, oh, wow, you know, I'd really like to have her do this for me because she's got all these people that say she's great. I think it can be really daunting to get those rejections and rejections and, and to feel like you still have something to offer. But once you get that first client, it's so much easier to get the second. And when you've got the second, it's really easy to find the third. And the, the thing that I really found that helped me was you take each of those subsequent clients and you allow it to move your business a little bit further along. So for example, when I started working, it was for peanuts. Like I think I was making like a dollar an hour when I factored in how much time I was making. But in that beginning, especially if you're using a platform like Upwork or some other thing that rates you, you know, with stars or satisfaction rates or whatever they've got in the beginning, you're not working for money. You're working for that feedback. So you have to kind of put yourself in the mindset of it's okay if I make nothing on this, it's not going to last forever. What I really want is that five star feedback because that gives me something I can point to and say, look, I'm amazing. And then with your next job, you raise your rate by a little bit. I call it scaffolding. Like the first job, okay, maybe make, that's a good word. Yeah. Yeah. The first job, fine. I make five bucks. Now I'm going to charge the next client 10. It's still really reasonable, but it's bumping me up every time. So that it makes it honest when you say, well, my current clients are paying me X. Yep. Yep. And so did you find, you know, because that is what I mentioned was that huge part of how quickly I observed you going up, up, up. Like it was a matter of, you know, weeks, months as you were scaling up, scaffolding. That's an awesome word. I'm going to borrow that. Um, would you say it's partly that external feedback in being able to say, yes, look at what I've done and now I can bump that rate up. But also, was it an internal thing for you as well? Going, yeah, okay, now it's worth that. Now it's worth that. Was that, was that internal part of process of the, the scaffolding process as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, some of it might have been a little bit prideful of, I'm worth a heck of a lot more than $5 an hour. I'm not going to work for $5 an hour. Um, but that's, you know, you talked about the the niche that I focused on in writing. And that's, that's part of why I ended up going there was what I found was there were a lot of people who wanted to do some of the things that I could do and were willing to do it for a lot less. But where nobody could compete, at least not at those lower rates, was for people who wanted native speakers or native writers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, someone in the Philippines cannot compete with my grammar, spelling, you know, sentence structure, whatever. Um, so it, it no became, awareness, I mean, for and writing that in plain language as well? Yeah, and just there was just things with people from other, for whom English is not necessarily their first language or for whom English may be a first language, but it's not US based. Okay. A lot of my, a lot of my clients, they don't want the copy for their website to look like it was written by someone overseas. That doesn't make them look good. It makes them look less reputable because they're American based businesses looking to serve American clients. And Native speakers can tell when they see stuff that's written with just a little bit of wording that's off, you know it and you think, okay, can I trust this business if it looks that, that skewed? So for me, um, it was really apparent that if I wanted to, to use the word use, command higher rates, that was the way that I was going to be able to do it because people in other countries at lower rates couldn't compete with me in that regard. So that was a lot of why I chose to go that direction. That's so awesome. And I, I would say here that, you know, what I've observed in, you know, things that Shannon's shared through our private group about when she's reached out to clients or when clients have reached out to her and the things that she's said is that her communication in and around a potential client having a conversation with her, onboarding a client, delivering back work to a client after the project has, has finished is exceptional. And I feel like that is a huge part of you not being perceived as like the talent, right? Because sometimes, you know, my experience working online over the past five years has been like, th there's people that are perceived as like the go-to people and they're constantly getting delegated the work, delegated work. And there's people that are perceived as um, this, I mean, this is just one way, it's not black and white, but there's people that are perceived as the talent, that awesome designer, but you've got to make sure you brief him perfectly and does the work and you know, but you got to do it on his terms or, you know, that awesome copywriter, but, you know, uh, make sure the brief is accurate first time. But 
what I feel is one of your real strengths is that you come on board and you position yourself as that partner with the client at all of those phases before that, as they're a potential client, when you're working with them, when you hand it back. Tell us a little bit more about like how you do that. Like what, what are some of the specifics, you know, and also what's your mindset behind how you're helping a client to work with you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that has been a great strategy for me as I look at new jobs to decide first, am I going to submit a proposal? And then when I do submit a proposal is um, I really try to see what I can suss out about that client before I say anything in my proposal. Like, for example, I do a lot of my, most of my new clients come to me through Upwork, not all of them. Some of it is word of mouth, some of it is other avenues, but for the most part, that's where I've built my clientele. And so let's say I get a proposal that comes in and it says, you know, really simple. We're looking for someone to update the copy on our website, period. That tells me nothing. So immediately I go to look at their profile name and I see, can I find the name of their business? Can I find the name of the person? And then do a Google search and find them on LinkedIn. Oh, they work for ABC Industries. Okay, what can I find out about that? Um, I have found that my clients are really impressed when I turn in that first proposal and first I call them by name. Hi, Kate. You know, it's great to hear from you. You know, thanks for your your, your request for proposal. You know, I, I'm imagining that you're hoping that I'll be able to do your copy for ABC Industries. What I notice about that right away is blah, blah, blah. You know, whether that's a compliment or whether that's, you know, I noticed that, you know, your images didn't load or I noticed that, you know, you only have two sentences and maybe you're looking to expand into a blog. Something that lets them know that I know who they are because then they see, wow, I didn't tell her anything and she took the time to go out there and not just find it, but to already give me something that's of value. You know, something that whether they hire me or not, they can look at and go, oh yeah, she was really right, we need to do this. Um, that's been probably the first thing that really has made a difference to me. Um, as I've gotten more involved, I've also been able to tell a little bit more easily if a client is one that I want to work with or not. I am not a drama queen. I'm very straightforward. You know, if I think something is going to be late, I'll probably let you know a week in advance if I can. I, I can't even remember when I've been late with anything, but you know, I, I try to be very, you know, upfront because it's, it's their business and, you know, they hired me to save them time, you know, to make them look good. And, you know, I, I want to, you know, be as straight with them as I can. Um, but I, I have just really found that as time has gone on, you can start to suss out if this person is going to be a handful to work with. Um, and I, I try to avoid that, like the plague. I don't want, I, I've had some nightmare clients that have left me in tears, uh -huh. you know, clients me asking myself for weeks, oh my gosh, maybe I'm really not very good at this. You know, maybe, I think they call it imposter syndrome. You know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't ask for Monica. Maybe I'm really not that good. Yes, so. everyone <laughs> happens to everyone, guys. If you're starting out, be prepared for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's you know, trying to figure out ahead of time, do I actually want to work with this person or not? And I find that the more approachable I am with a client, I wait to kind of measure the temperature of their response. If they come back to me and are, you know, very, you know, warm and open and whatever, then I think, okay, this could be a good relationship. Even maybe if it's not a project that I would have ordinarily taken on, if I think the client is going to be decent and treat me with respect and, you know, be decent to work with, I may take the project even if it's not something that I thought I would take. Conversely, if I think a if I think a drama queen is going to be a problem, if I think a client is going to be a problem, then even if it's a job that I think looks like a peach, I I'm saving myself the hassle because a horrible client will suck the energy out of you. It'll make you doubt that you can do well what you can actually do well, and it sets you back emotionally for a while. So yeah, right. So do you feel like making like those boundaries and those guidelines for yourself of when you're saying yes and no, you know, allowed you to grow the work volume more rapidly, like because you're keeping that energy free as you started to refine that ability to, you know, determine that upfront. Yeah, I really started to look at it as, okay, because quite frankly, we were pretty desperate when I got started, not, you know, to, oh my gosh, we're going to need to, you know, sell the house kind of thing. But, you know, to the point where the income was not super great. So the desperation factor sometimes would make me feel pressured to take jobs that I really didn't want to take, especially in the beginning. Um, but I got to a point kind of like you were saying, where I would look at it as, okay, 
what's the actual cost of taking this job? Not the money that I'm going to make, but what will it cost me? And to be able to say, you know what, if I close the door on that, I'm leaving the door open for an opportunity to come later that's probably going to be better than this one. And it is not worth my time, my mental energy to spend it on this person who's probably going to be a pain in the backside. Yeah. For sure. And, you know, I just add in there with my experiences, like, you know, I've been in that position too, where, okay, the income is really going to help here. And even though you've got that niggling intuition saying I should decline this project, you say yes, because you know that that income is coming in at the end of the week or next week or what have you. And I would say, you know, and I know sometimes when people are getting started with their online careers, not always, but sometimes they're in a similar position. And I would say that even if, you feel like you are going to say yes and you shouldn't have said yes and it is holding you back or you do end up with a difficult client. You'll still get skills out of it. You'll still get to learn how to refine your client collaboration and communication process. You'll still increase your confidence in, in what you're providing, what you've got to offer. And you can have confidence that you can comfortably and politely let people go start, get skilled up, get runs on the board and, and clean up, so to speak. Um, because sometimes you are in that position where, yeah, sure, a bit of money is going to help. So don't feel like you've necessarily, you know, this is my opinion, done it wrong if you end up with a not ideal client. It's that constant scaffolding, as Shannon mentioned, with your rate, with the quality of your work, with the quality of your clients, with your enjoyment and your fulfillment and, and your income and your volume and your fulfillment and your pleasure as you sit down at the laptop can all start to increase provided you've got your intention there. And sure, you're going to get into uncomfortable situations where you might have taken on the wrong client or what have you, but you can feel confident in yourself that you know how to move on from there. And that's where you've got your, your vision set. Would you agree with that kind of thing, Shane, yeah. that sometimes people just end up in that situation as much as they could get that advice from you and me, you know, down the track? Yeah, absolutely. Especially with that whole sense of, you know, that imposter syndrome and that fear of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. You know, it's, I've been doing this, like you said, probably for about a year and a half now. And I still get those butterflies when I apply with a new client, even though I've done this before. You know, I think my success rate on Upwork right now is 100%. You know, clearly I'm doing something right. Um, but one of the things too is that I think as you, as you go along, one of the things that I think helps, especially in the beginning with, with any kind of client, even if you expect that it's going to be long-term work, is for your sense of security and theirs to say, to propose some kind of trial basis. You know, and a lot of times I'll put that into my proposal, especially if I think my rates are considerably higher. Like I'll get proposals that say, you know, we'd like to do this project and we'd like you to, you know, we'd like to pay you X. And let's say my rate is 20% higher than X. And it's clearly posted on my profile, but for whatever reason, they sent me something anyway. Um, I'll always put there to them, you know, well, you know, I notice that your budget is whatever, you know, give me a better sense of what you're looking for. So I'll know if I can, you know, accommodate your budget. But, you know, one of the things that we can do is let's try a, a one article trial piece. And then you can determine if the quality of that is worth the investment that goes beyond your budget. And that way, if you do a, a segment trial, you know, for something like a VA type skill, maybe it's a one week trial or a one month trial or just one skill, you know, maybe it's just um, Facebook posts or maybe it's Twitter management or whatever it is you want to do. Just making something discreet so that everybody knows here's the start and here's the stop. And yeah. at that point, back together and we say, okay, did this work for you? Did this work for me? You know, did this work for your budget? Um, what I have found with the majority of my clients is that if there's something that I've gotten a proposal for that they're really thinking long-term and we do a trial, um, honestly, I, I, th I can think of maybe one client out of 200 that said, yeah, no, this didn't really work for me. Everybody else, it was either, yes, that worked wonderfully and the project is done, or yes, that worked wonderfully, and can you please keep working with me? Um, my best clients, um, I have one that I got back, not this past March, but the one prior, and it started out with a really small project. She wanted um, 10 articles um, based on this one particular topic, but the total set I could tell was 50, and so I turned in the 10, and I said, what would it take for you to give me the other 40? She was like, oh, well, nothing. Would, would you like to do them? Yes, yes, I would. And her, her, the, what she was offering to pay was fantastic. Um, it was a fixed rate project, but because of how fast I worked, it made my hourly rate figure out to be about 75 to 100 an hour, which was like, whoa, big money. Um, 
And then she said, well, I have another type of project. Would you be interested? Now, by then, I already knew she was so easy to work with. Um, she paid well. She was really respectful. She was really human. So I thought, okay, why not? Um, and she, her, her work is kind of come and go. And I think that's what's been hard for me as a writer, as opposed to people who are doing more VA type skills. So I think with the VA skills, you know that they're going to need you forever. If someone's asking you to manage their, their Twitter or their Facebook or whatever, they need you all the time. Whereas with writing, it's a one-off or a two-off or a here's this thing that I need, but once you've turned it in, I don't need anymore. Um, so for her, she kind of comes and goes. But when, when she comes up and says, hey, Shannon, by the way, I, I need you again. Are you available? I drop everything to work for her. Because she last, was it last month or the month before, out of the blue, she said to me, hey, by the way, I have some work for you. Are you interested? And I said, okay, you don't have to ask. Yes, of course. And she said, and by the way, um, I'm going to give you a 25% raise just because, and you're awesome. Wow. Proactive increase in rate from the client's end. That is awesome. It happens, but it's not that common unless you're saying this is what my rate is. So that's awesome. You didn't ask for it. And she just said, yeah, that's on the table now. Yeah, it, it was completely out of the blue. And she was already really generous with what she was paying me. She's the one client I would have never asked for a raise because quite frankly, her work is so easy for me to do. Some of the projects that she has me do, I can do them so quickly. It makes my hourly rate turn out to be between $100 and $200 an hour. Now it's fixed rate, so it's not like she's you know paying that, but because I can get it done that quickly, great. Um, so I would have never asked for her for a raise, but she said, you know, I want you to be my best paid writer. You're completely worth it. And yeah, here's a raise. So it was, was like, oh, yes, please more. That is so good to hear. And I think, you know, that is a, a really good point there too, guys, is that when you find those business savvy clients that have a well-established business that know how to collaborate, you know, either they've, you know, they're an established online business owner or they've got past business history where they kind of know, okay, when I've got a good person on team, I'm going to perceive them as a partner and I'm going to do the right thing by them. That's exactly what's going to happen. She's perceiving Shannon as like, okay, Shannon's running her own show. She can get work from here, 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 or here. I'm onto something here. I'm going to make it worth her while. And that really starts to happen. I find as you grow your career, as you start to have confidence in yourself, where you're able to get yourself in front of those clients that know um, when they're onto a good thing and therefore make it a win-win with their collaboration with you. So that's such a good example of that. And the other thing that I kind of want to pick out there of what you shared, Shannon, you said something about you could notice, that, well, you initially got delegated the 10 articles from her, but you said you could notice it was a full set of 50. Now, digital, the way that I describe it is, you know, um, digital detective work, right? So it's, you know, whether it's like what you talked about when you've got a new potential client, you're doing that public digital detective work, or whether it's you've already got a client on board, you've got a few logins to either to their back end of the website or their e-commerce or whatever, and you can see what potentially is on offer and be able to proactively offer additional services. So what was the specifics of that digital detective work there? How did you know that she had additional work that hadn't yet been delegated? Well, it was really easy because the articles I was writing was on a particular topic, um, customized for 10 different states. Oh, well, okay. There's, there's 50 states. So give me the other 40. Okay. So, yeah. okay. That is fantastic. And the way that you worded that offer was kind of, uh, the, uh, what's the right wording? Quite a direct way of wording it. Not saying, oh, would you possibly want to do that? It was more like a, a warm offer and an assumption. Is that, is that right? Yeah, definitely. One of the things that I think really helps is, um, I know that they use the word upsell a lot. And I think that kind of reminds you of like going to McDonald's and you know, you ask for a Coke and they ask if you want to supersize it or whatever. But the way I look at it is, is I try to look at my client's, you know, full kind of profile and say, is there anything else I can do that will help them with their business? Not in like a cheesy, you know, I want you to supersize so I can make more money, but more of a, hey, you know what, you've asked me to do this one thing and I'm happy to do that. You know, I will do that till the cows come home and I will do it to the best of my ability. But I also notice that you've got this thing going on. You know, feel free to say no, but here's something I'm thinking about for you that maybe you might want to consider. Um, I've got a really good example. Um, I'm not taking a ton of new clients on Upwork because they raised their rates for freelancers and they raised their rates for clients. And um, I actually have enough work with most of my regular clients to keep me as busy as I want to be most of the time. Um, but I had a client who um, approached me out of the gate, was ready to offer, I actually raised my rates to try and offset that 
price increase from Upwork, you know, made me, you know, gave me a proposal. It was a, uh, a niche that I've kind of specialized in, and I can talk more about that later if you want. Yes. Um, but it, it was a niche I specialized in, and it looked like pretty straightforward. I did my little bit of sleuthing, found the guy's website. His blog was not great. So I thought, okay, this is, this is going to be easy. This is not a client I need to feel you know, petrified that I can't measure up to. This is something I could do in my sleep. His blog's horrible. I can write 50 gazillion things and make it look better in no time at all. So he, he wrote to me and yes, immediately gave me an offer. And I was like, well, that's a little bit weird. You know, I thought we would kind of, you know, like you don't ask someone to marry you on the first date. You don't really expect to have the job offer at your going rate with very little back and forth, but I felt okay about it. And I thought, well, let's give this a try. So I thought I was his only writer. Huh, little did I know he had hired a team of five or six people. Okay, that's fine. You know, I'm a team player, no big deal. But I could tell that he was really kind of scattered with his approach, you know, trying to ask, okay, now that I see that we're part of a team, you know, what, what, what how do you see this going? Are we all going to have a particular topic to write about? You know, are we going to have, you know, some kind of structure, you know, when's the due date, and he was really kind of out there. So um, I thought about his project all weekend. And I that, that's something I would say too, is clients love it when they see that you're invested in their business, that you're invested in making them be successful, because they're not paying you for your time, they're paying for theirs. They're saying it is worth more to me give you this money to do this well than for me to try and do it and not do it so well. So anyway, I've been kind of noodling over his, his whole situation all weekend. And so he had asked this team of people, Hey, any suggestions, let me know. So I came back on Monday and I said, you know, I've been thinking about your project all weekend. And here's the things that really stand out to me. You know, first, you know, you, you've got all of us writing for your blog and you want suggestions, but what's your social media strategy? What are you doing to push these out there? I said, because if we write all of these articles, but you don't have a way to get people there, it's like throwing a party without sending out invitations. You know, do you have a strategy for how you're going to get people to see these things? And I said, by the way, my husband is a social media director. You know, he has his own, you know, consulting company. If you need any help in that regard, I think I know just the guy for you. Let me know. So I, I told him that and I said, you know, second off, I said, <clears throat> do you need any help with managing your writers? I said, I am Imagine that you would rather spend your time focusing on growing your business and doing what you do rather than adding, you know, proofreading and editing and kind of corralling your writers on top of what you're already doing. I said, I've been a contributing editor for two magazines for almost a year now. I've been a team leader. So if you feel like you want some help, it would be no problem for me to add that to what I'm doing to proofread so that the only thing you have to do at the end of the day is give final approval for what's going to go live on the site. Um, you know, third, if you need an editorial calendar, that's something I could really easily pull together. You know, not sure what your thoughts are, you know, feel free to say yes or no, but if you need any help in that regard, I've got the experience and I would be more than happy to lend a hand. So I think really just knowing what your client needs, but, he may not or she may not even know that that's what they need. I think it's just kind of really looking at beyond the scope of the little project you've been given and say, what else does this client need that I might be able to help them realize they need and maybe I can provide that service too. That is such a good example of, you know, proactively growing your work with those existing clients. And, you know, what I would say there of what Shannon was sharing is, she is, in the way she's offering that additional service to clients, she's doing two things. She's offering something specific. So she's taking the time to go, okay, if this was my business, here is the next thing. You know, when she was, all of those examples that she just shared, but you know, that last one specifically where, where she knows that, okay, you're going to need someone coordinating what's going on with this team of writers, etc. She's offering something specific. And not only that, but she's doing it from the position of having quite clearly having the, the business owner's best interests at heart. Like the, the way she's offering it is very much the business owner saying, wow, this person really knows what I need. They've got the similar, they know what my goals are and they're trying to support that. Of course, it's a win for her because that brings in more work, that increases her income, et cetera. But contrast that to say an approach that I see um, come up time and again is where people are positioning it like, oh, if there's any other work, just let me know. Now, there is always more work. There is always more work. But like what Shannon is sharing is when the, when the business owner is trying to free up their time, it takes time to sit there and strategize about their business. 
and match what is required with your skill set. They might not know you that well yet. You might have just offered one thing. They might not know your full range of what you can offer. And so for them to, to initiate a conversation with you where they're saying, oh, hey, what do you think about managing my team? What do you think about doing social media? That is going to take time out of their revenue generating activities. Right. And just like what Shannon was sharing, they're not paying for your time. You know, they're paying for their time. So what you're doing when you proactively offer work in that way, something specific and with the business owner's best interest at heart is you're completely wiping out the need for them to invest any brain power, any time in thinking through what they could ask you to do, in delegating that, in having a negotiation with you because you're outright saying, I can do this or I know the person who can do this or I can get the person who can do this. And you know, here's how it could work. And so you paint the picture for them and you make it easier for them to just say, yeah, let's go ahead or no, I've got this person doing it or whatever it might be. But you make them have that experience of you just completely wiping out the, the you know, the time requirement of them growing and up leveling their business. It's huge. And a lot of the times they're going to be saying yes, just like what Shannon was sharing, because if it's growing their business, they're getting a return on investment for that hourly rate they're, they're pulling out of their pocket to pay to you. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that um, it's easy to set yourself apart, um, and you talk about this in your course, is A, being indispensable, becoming that person that they think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if she's not available? You know, oh my goodness, you know, am I going to have to get someone else? And I've seen that happen with some of my clients, and it's really gratifying. But I think part of that becoming indispensable is being very reliable. You know, when I have a client that sends me something to say, hey, are you available? Um, my clients know I don't work on Sundays, so if they send me something on a Sunday, they're probably not going to hear from me till Monday. But any other day of the week, if I hear from them, I try to respond, you know, within the hour if I can, because you know, I've always got my phone on me. It's not a big deal to, you know, send a quick email when I'm, you know, running a kid to swim practice or whatever. Um, but just to be incredibly communicative and responsive, you know, if there's something that you think you might be delivering late on or... You know, everybody has stuff. Everybody has, you know, emergencies that arise or whatever. Um, nine times out of 10, if I tell my clients, you know, I'm really sorry. I know that I thought I was going to have X, Y, Z done by Friday. You know, this thing came up. Is Saturday okay? Or, you know, I know that you had a deadline. Is it movable? Or what part do you really have to have right away? Um, pretty much everybody they work with, they're, they're normal people. They understand that things come up. And just having that that communication back and forth, mm -hmm. it's kind of sad that that's what sets you apart because it makes me wonder, well, what's everybody else doing? But I think just having that high standard for yourself to say, well, how would I want to be treated? You know, <laughs> I, I needed my car to be fixed. And I called the auto mechanic and they said, yeah, I might be able to fit you in sometime. Or you dropped your car off. It's a week and they haven't even called you to tell you when it's going to be ready. That would put a major dent, no pun intended, a major dent in your, your plans and your ability to do the things that you do clients are the same way if they've given you something to work on communicate with them about it and you know ask questions if you need to you know clarify you know don't go overboard you know don't ask you know questions that are going to take them three hours to answer you know maybe get started on that piece of work and say hey this is what I've got so far am I on the right track or do you want to bump me in a little bit different direction uh, but just being really communicative with the clients I think has been the one thing that from the feedback that I get from them is they're always really really pleased especially being on time or early with deadlines they're just like wow you got this done already yeah, no problem. You're welcome. And I think that's what keeps your clients coming back is just that that communication and that reliability. You don't have to be a rock star. You can be good enough, you yes. know, or just decent even. But as long as you're communicating and you're taking accountability for things, they're going to keep coming back. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. And I speak to that from personal experience as well. I've outright declined um, the opportunity to work with a writer that I was just like, oh, you know, I brought on this new client and I would really love this writer because they've got the knowledge in this topic area that this client works in that I don't have the personal experience in. And I really want this writer, but they're, they're very slow on the response time, sometimes up to four days or five days or what have you. The work, the quality of the work is amazing, but I would, I would instead, or I have done this where I've hired a writer that I was less like wowed by in terms of the output, the quality of the writing. But I knew outright by the way that they corresponded with me that I would never have to go to my client over on this side and say, we haven't got the content in time. And from my perspective with our business model, that is so much more valuable to me. So I'll pay for that any day of the week, that reliability more so than a higher quality standard. It still, of course, has to um, 
it still has to meet a certain benchmark, right? You can't turn in, right. you know. But yeah, maybe, it, maybe it doesn't sparkle, but it gets yes, the job done. Exactly. And so what you're saying there about not needing to be a rock star, guys, like Shannon is a talented writer. She it is one of her strengths. But I think what she's sharing there is so important. It, it's not just a, a nice fluffy thing to say. That really is the truth that the, the client knowing that they've got you there is more valuable, is going to get you more long-term clients able to command higher rates than just being exceptionally talented or skilled at one particular thing. I found that so true. And the other thing, you know, what Shannon was mentioning about that responsiveness and that communication, when you're coming in new to virtual work and to collaborating with clients online, um, I feel like sometimes there can be this confusion that responsiveness and communication means that, okay, Shannon mentioned she's sometimes got a phone with her and she'll quickly reply, you know, within an hour or what have you. Let someone know, you know, where she's at, what's going on, what's possible, what's not possible. That can be separated. It should be separated from the actual time that you're completing and delivering the work. So I feel like sometimes people go all the way over this side instead of separating out these two communication channels, the responsiveness and the, and the conversation with the client and the getting the work done on, on, a, on a set schedule with your boundaries. They're two separate things. If you try and bring them in together and not separate them, what happens is you feel overwhelmed and you feel like you have to start working and get it back within 24 hours and do it, jump when the client says jump and you know drive yourself nuts and go back to your offline work world because you think that's what you have to do. Or you do what some other well-established freelancers do and you, you have it over on this side where you see a, an incoming request and I don't do this, but I, I have it happen to me a lot or I have had it happen to me a lot. And um, the freelancer is, is thinking, well, um, I don't have time to do that project now, so I'll just get back to them in a couple of days and I'll let them know that I can do it in, in another couple of weeks, right? So... So what happens there is you don't realize that those two communications can be separated out. And when you separate them out, what's happening is that over here, you've got this great responsiveness. You're showing people you hear. It's the, it's the virtual equivalent of the head nod and the eye acknowledgement as they walk in into your store, right? You're giving them that acknowledgement. You're saying, yep, I'm here. And then on the other hand, you're saying, okay, here's my schedule. Here's when I can have it delivered by. And yes, you're delivering on that deadline, but you don't have to say it's going to be tomorrow or what have you. And Shannon does that really well. Um, it's a huge thing that people get caught up on when they're first starting out and, and start to refine as they get their own um, confidence to do so. But know that you can very much do that at the outset. You can respond to someone quickly without the, um, the feeling that you're going to mislead them into thinking that you're also going to get the work done right away. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. I think it's important to establish those boundaries. And I completely agree with what you're saying is that in the beginning, you know, you feel like, oh my gosh, I have to do everything all the time. And if they want it in two days, I have to deliver it in one. If they're asking me, and it's really easy to put that pressure on yourself because you do want to establish yourself as being a go-to person and build up that portfolio or that reputation or those ratings or whatever system you're using. Um, but you're right, you do burn out really fast and you start losing that work-life balance that you have to have. No matter how you're coming to being a VA or freelancing or whatever it is, you still have a life and you still that life still needs you. So I think it can be hard, like you said, especially at the beginning to separate that. But I've really found that clients respect boundaries as long as you respect the boundaries. You know, if you're telling them, no, I don't work on weekends, and then every time they send you a message on a Saturday, you respond, well, you're really showing them that as long as they keep pushing, you're still going to answer. Whereas if you tell them, you know, I'm not available on weekends. If it's an emergency, let me know, but I may not respond until Monday. I've found that more often than not, they either won't message me at all, or they'll send me a message and saying, Hey, I've got this project for you. You know, don't worry about it till Monday. I'm just getting it off my desk, but I won't expect an answer till Monday. And then I don't respond till Monday. They've given me that permission. You know, I don't need to respond before then. I'll meet their needs by responding to them on that schedule. And it works out for both of us. Um, and I, and I think that most most clients, most businesses, especially the kinds that I think VA people work for, you know, we're not working for most industries that are life and death. You know, nobody's going to die if I don't write their blog post for them today. They're just not, you know, where sometimes in our personal lives, there can be life and death things. You know, you've got a kid swinging from the chandelier or whatever else. <laughs> um, I think for the most part, you know, we, we can establish those boundaries and clients will respect them. They understand that, you know, people are, you know, 
people and they have lives and you know fine you grow your business on the weekends that's wonderful sometimes i do choose to work on a saturday because i wanted wednesday off or you know we we were going to go to the beach and it was a gorgeous day and fine you know so i may work on saturday if it meets my convenience but i'm certainly not telling people i'll work for you 24 hours a day because i don't i don't want to get those messages in fact one of the things that i remember from very very early on when I was all excited about, you know, oh my gosh, someone wants me on Elance. Um, for those who may not know, Elance was bought out by Upwork. It doesn't exist anymore, but that was really my bread and butter in the beginning. Um, I remember I had my, um, my work email, my Gmail set to give me a little, you know, ding-a-ding -ding thing whenever I got a message and I was only getting them from Elance. I had to turn that thing off. It was stressing me out. I was like, oh my gosh, I have another message and I have to respond and I'm trying to cook dinner. No. So I finally had to shut it off. I'm like, I'm going to look at it when I feel like it because it started to, to like give me the nervous reaction every time I heard that little sound I'm like this is like Pavlov for writers <laughs> but so, this was incoming requests though right yeah for the most part I mean every so often I would have you know can you do this can you do that but some of the requests I would get you know can you write my erotica book yeah that'd be a no <laughs> It was just too stressful knowing that I had these messages coming and I didn't think it was a time that I could respond. So that was one of my ways of establishing those boundaries was I am not at the beck and call of my Gmail. I will get to it when I get to it, which is fairly often. But if I'm cooking dinner, I don't want that thing telling me I've got a message. So good move. Absolutely. I do the same. All those notifications off. As long as you're checking in once every 24 hours, you're sweet. <laughs> Um, or different depending on your your client relationships so let's talk a little bit about you know you mentioned you decided to focus in on an, a niche and how did that change how you were collaborating with clients first of all what is it and and uh, do you work outside of it you know how did you kind of implement that to grow your work volume yeah um let me give a little hat tip over to danny i think it's pronounced margulies he's got a site called freelance to win and where Danielle's course gives you the how to, you know, this is how to do this thing. This is how to, you know, gain this skill. He really tells you the psychology of how to get work. You know, now that you've got the skill, how do you position yourself so that, you know, you're not billing out at a dollar per hour. I think he bills out at 125 an hour, like no problem. Um, and he shows you like all the projects he's had. So he's not just whistling Dixie. Um, so I took his course as well, just to kind of, I, first off, he had an amazing free set of strategies, kind of like you did with your, your, I think it was a set of four free things. He kind of does the same thing and he'll send out tips or whatever. So really highly recommend people look at his free stuff. Just applying his free stuff increased my work like crazy. Um, so no, anyway, I actually, for anyone watching this, we'll link to that below this video. So you can see that free series of Danny's that Shannon's talking about is exceptional. Perfect. Um, so anyway, so I, I did his course and I, I think he talked about this in a free tip. So I don't think I'm giving away much by saying it. And I've heard other people say it as well. So I think I'm okay. Um, but he really talked about focusing your profile, whether that's LinkedIn, your website, whatever it is that you're offering to focus it on a niche if you can. Now, whether that's like for me, a content area, I decided to focus on real estate and personal finance and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but you know, for maybe for you, it's you're just going to focus on you know, um, a particular category like food. I think I saw someone in the, the mastermind group of the biz skill saying that they were all food related. Um, you know, some people have done um, health and lifestyle or whatever it is. Find something that you have that you're kind of not necessarily an expert because that tends to make you nervous. Well, I'm not an expert in anything, but something that you're passionate about or that you've had experience. Maybe you don't like it, but you know a lot about it. Something that you've got detailed information on or experience or something um, because that, that was one of the things that he recommended doing and I was really nervous because I had really billed myself as being a Jill of all trades. Whatever you need, I can do it within certain parameters. I already said I'm not going to do erotica. Um, I'm not going to do your homework assignment for you. You know, certain things I wouldn't do, but in general, it was whatever your topic is, I'm great at research. I'll make myself an expert in it in really no time at all and I'll get you what you need. So I was really hesitant to kind of focus in on something because I thought, you know, I'm going to lose all of these customers that I've had, you know, they wouldn't have come to me necessarily if I was focused on this really narrow area. But I found it was completely the opposite, exactly as he had promised, where when you position yourself as an expert in whatever it is, um, people will pay a premium for someone who knows 
detailed things. And I think the analogy is, again, to cars, you know, you're going to pay more for someone who specializes in BMWs to fix your BMW than to, you know, Joe rocket science guy down the street who says he can fix everything because you want that specific knowledge for that very expensive car. You know, if you have a, an expensive business, you know, something where it really matters, they want someone who's an expert. So for me, I ended up choosing real estate and personal finance. Um, the real estate was kind of funny. We had originally thought that we were going to buy a rental property. And so I spent a year um, reading a website called Bigger Pockets, um, getting really, really well versed in, you know, how to choose a property, you know, what kind of market to look for, what price to look for, and so forth. And then that part of our life completely imploded. And I was like, why did I just spend a year doing all of this? You know, what, what good is it? Um, so a year after that, we ended up renting out our own house. I'm like, okay, so it wasn't, you know, for total, you know, a waste. We rented out our own house and traveled the country for seven months. Cool. Okay. That was useful. But I realized as I was trying to focus on a niche, I'm like, I know a lot about real estate and I'm not expert, expert level. You know, if you had me talk to a realtor, I'd be like, okay, good luck. Um, but you know, kind of um, business to consumer type knowledge, you know, when, when is a good time to rent? Um, what are some uh, unexpected costs you might find when, you know, getting a mortgage for the first time, kind of basic consumer stuff that I've lived through. I can totally do that. Um, and personal finance, just because I'm really frugal and I, my grandmother put it this way, I can squeeze a Buffalo nickel and make it poop dimes. <laughs> so I'm really good at like leveraging everything to try and save money. So I had a lot of experience with personal finance, budgeting, credit cards, you know, how to have a good credit score, that kind of thing. And I really found that not only did that help me attract higher paying clients, it also didn't deter other people from still sending me proposals, which really floored me. I really thought that once I put that in my title, I think it's something like um, lightning fast SEO savvy expert in real estate and personal finance. I think that's my title. Um, people were still bringing other things to me. And I was like, well, yeah, I could do that too. I think I had someone writing for their, um, their swim school and I had another person come to me. Gosh, I don't even remember what it was for. I think it was bedwetting products totally random, but yeah, okay, fine. I can do that too. So it, it was really pleasantly surprising to me to see that focusing on that niche really helped me command higher rates. It's really interesting what you're saying that it didn't deter people because they're still perceiving you. They're still seeing your feedback. They're still perceiving you as like someone who's all in on this, knows what they're doing, has their back. I find a similar thing with um, when you say as a VA that you're focusing in on one particular software system. You say, I'm all in on Infusionsoft, or I'm all in on MailChimp or ConvertKit or whatever it is. Um, if you're passionate about that, that allows you to communicate that excitement as an entryway to people that are using those systems. But likewise, it doesn't deter people that aren't using those from saying, hey, I'm not using that. Have you got experience with this? Would you work in that? Does someone on your team work on that? Um, the same scenario happens there because even though you're, you know, you're hanging your hat, so to speak, on this thing that you love, um, overall, what you're still saying is, I love my career. I'm excited about this. I'm excited to help you. And so, yeah, that interesting scenario where it doesn't seem to block out other opportunities. So that's interesting you've had that experience as well. Yeah, it was really pretty surprising to me. I mean, it was very gratifying to see, wow, people are still coming to me for other things. But like you said, I think it's they see not necessarily your content area, but your level of expertise. Um, yeah. Again, on Upwork, you know, with all the work that I've done, you know, like I said, I think I've got a 100% satisfaction rate. And people, a lot of the times, they're searching for keywords. So I think what happens sometimes is people are searching for a keyword. And so my profile comes up because I've done a project previously within their market. Like in the beginning, I had done some... Um, um, reviews on uh, Minecraft things. Oh. Like I had like, my son, like I gave him topics. I'm like, okay, you give me an audio file of your stream of consciousness on this topic and I'm going to turn it into an article. But that meant for a long time after that, people were coming be like, can you do this Minecraft thing? Do you want to write this book on Minecraft? I'm like, no, not really. But I think I was coming to the top of the pile because I'd had projects with that. So I think that's some of how these people are still finding me is they're saying, oh, hey, I Googled or I did a keyword search for this particular topic. And oh, it says she focuses on this, but okay, look, she had three clients in this other area that I'm looking for and they all gave her five stars. So, hey, maybe she's available. That's such a good example to put out there. I love that. Now, you were saying, so with the online biz skills course, as a writer, going all in on writing, you didn't need to use a huge portion of the how-tos, the, the, the structured like processes for how you do certain things in online marketing support. 
but as a writer, you said there were certain parts that you picked out. So can you tell me a bit about that? What are the supporting things that go in and around um, with your writing? Yeah, for sure. Now, you know, forgive me, it's been a while since I've gone, you know, under the hood to look to see what you have there now. So you may have added things or whatever. But what I really remember um, from back then that has applied to me as a writer and still is, um, were image sourcing, image formatting, and WordPress. Because I'll have clients pretty regularly that say, okay, we have this project. And one of the first questions I'll ask as we're kind of, you know, negotiating that relationship is, am I sending this to you as a Google Doc or are you having me blog directly into WordPress? And a lot of them are like, oh, you, you know how to do WordPress? And yes, you know, I, I, have, I have basic, you know, skills in WordPress and it helps me that my husband does that for a living. So if I get confused or, you know, lost, I can always kind of lean over to him and say, hey, what did I get wrong here? Um, but that's really been a value add for a lot of the clients. that They don't then have to go in and put this into WordPress and do all of these other things. It's something that, you know, quite honestly, I can put it, you know, the first draft into WordPress just as easily as I can put it into Google Docs. So that's been really helpful. Um, just giving me enough that I felt confident that I wasn't going to blow up their entire website if I put that blog post into WordPress. Um, still a little bit fledgling with images and stuff, but I, I learned enough, especially, you, you have a pretty big section on attribution, right? Uh, for, yeah, when you're doing Creative Commons images and et cetera, yes, yes. So we talk a lot a bit about, you know, the different sources of where you can get images on behalf of clients and being proactive about getting that information out of them. So that you're not, you know, floundering going, should I get a free image or should I buy a stock one or do they have original photos? Does it need to be attributed? You know, all those types of things. And I, one of the places I remember bailing my clients out in that regard was because I knew that that was something you had to look for, I noticed that they didn't. Like they were just putting stuff out there and I said, okay, does this need an attribution? This looks like you took it from, you know, somebody else's website. You know, you may want to consider that. I don't know if you're going to get into trouble. However, you know, if you would like me to source you an image that you're allowed to use free and legally, I'd be glad to do that. So, you know, kind of catching them in things that they might not even be aware of. Yeah, that's so huge. And again, bringing up those opportunities to be proactive and, and, and at the same time demonstrate that you've got their back, you've got their best interests at heart. It's a huge part of working virtually, I think, is that trust is, is established when they know it means more to you than the paycheck, when they know that you're like, you're interested in how this online world works in how, you know, image licensing works in how, you know, WordPress works, whatever it might be. And the trust comes, they're not going to be, you know, going through their timesheets with a fine tooth comb going, oh, that was 10 minutes longer than it should have taken or what have you, when they know that, you know, that is your passion and that's your interest to have their best interests. So that is so awesome to hear. I mean, like there's just so, so many tips. Guys, if you want to, like if I was starting my career fresh, brand new now, I would seriously be watching this a second time now, the first time for entertainment and engagement, the second time just like there was so many like specific phrasing points, language that Shannon uses, things that she says to clients, her mindset that I would be taking notes on, so much valuable stuff that sits outside of the specific skill set that you plan to offer, like huge. Um, but before we finish up, Shannon, I also want to talk about like you, like this is your career. We've gone right into the freelancing, the client collaboration side of things. Let's talk about the bigger picture of how this fits in with your family life. Um, you guys as a family, one of the things that's really stood out to me um, is Shannon, Rob, and the kids, they work as a team very visibly. They are, um, well, she'll share with you the age of her kids, et cetera, but, you know, just from my perspective as an outsider, viewing from across the other side of the world through their personal blogs and social media and that kind of thing is they're really on team with each other. They pick a vision, they go after it. They adapt what they're doing to make something work. If something stops working, they get their heads together and brainstorm what's the best scenario to make this fit? What should we do next? Um, that has been so inspiring to me. And I think that's a really huge thing if you're thinking about this virtual career, not just on your own, but as a family. Shannon, can you tell us a little bit about how that's worked for you guys and, and how the kids come into play, homeschooling, all that kind of thing? Yeah, you bet. Um, one of the, That was another one of the reasons that being a writer has worked out really well for me is, um, you know, conversations like this, you know, where I'm on the webcam and everything's quiet in the background are pretty few and far between. Um, my kids are 9, 13, 15, and 17, and you think, oh, they're not babies. They still fight. So, I didn't want to have a career where someone was going to want me on Skype regularly or they needed me to be available from, you know, nine to five or whatever. I really wanted something that I could do 
when I could fit it in. And on Tuesday, that might be at nine in the morning, but on Wednesday, that might be nine o'clock at night. So I really needed that flexibility. And writing is very flexible that way for the most part. And it can be if you choose the clients that let it be so. You know, you'll find writing projects out there that are like, we need someone to turn in five, 500 word pieces by 9 a.m. every day. Yeah, that's not me. Thanks, but no thanks. Um, so that, that's been one part is that's really helped our flexibility. Um, when we, when I started freelancing, it was, again, not this January, but the one prior. And we were kind of also building this bucket list idea of we want to take the kids around the country and show them the country where they're from. We had taken them places overseas, you know, a week here or a couple days there, but we thought there's so many places in America that they haven't seen. And our life just kind of started opening up to where, you know, this thing that would have stopped us was gone. And then he lost his job. So, well, okay, we don't have to worry about, you know, walking away from six figures and benefits because there it went. So all of these paths started opening up and we thought you know why not we can be poor and nervous at home or we can be poor and nervous from everywhere so let's do this thing so and when was this um we left it was almost exactly a year ago it was july 25th of last year so now i'm getting all the pop-ups on my facebook of one year ago today wow we were at wall drug or we were at mount rushmore wow that was epic so so anyway, so we, we planned on doing this one year slow traveling of the country and we would see how things worked. Now we didn't do it in an RV because my kid's in a box, bad idea. And somebody's not gonna come out of it alive. <laughs> so, so we decided to do um, rental homes, like vacation rentals. So first month we did you know hardcore road trip and we're like Motel 6 hoping the Wi-Fi works so we can you know, do our client work and sending them a text message. I'm really sorry, I don't have good Wi-Fi today. I'll try to do better tomorrow. You know, knowing that eventually we would be you know, in a rental house for a month and we would have good access. And we let our clients know that way, way, way in advance that hey, you know, this particular stretch of time is gonna be really sketchy, so get us everything before or after. But you know, if you've got something in the middle, we'll do our best. I even remember telling a client in the middle, I think I was in Wyoming, I'm like, as much as I would love to help you with this, you need availability that I can't give you. Here's this person I would love to refer you to. So anyway, so we, we traveled the country and we thought it was going to be for a full year. Um, we really thought that, you know, okay, epic, we're going to go for a year. We were even thinking, hey, you know, maybe in year two we'll be, you know, neighbors with Danielle in Costa Rica. Yeah, well, they left. So, you know, good thing we didn't plan to do that. Um, <laughs> But we, we really found that as we traveled with the kids, that they weren't as intrepid as we hoped they would be. Now, Danielle's kids are a lot younger, and it's really all they've ever known. But for my kids, they lived their entire life in the same county. You know, so for them, this was, you know, just leaving home was a huge, huge, huge big deal to them. And we really just found that they didn't take to it the way that we hoped that they would. You know, it was cool to see all these things, you know, Crater Lake and Devil's Tower. And we took a cruise to Alaska and we went to Alcatraz and, you know, all of these things. But my kids really, almost from the beginning, especially my two younger ones, they just craved stability and they craved friends. Like we'd be in a place for a month and they'd be like, great, we're leaving again. You know, or we've stayed one place two months. Well, why bother making friends? We're just gonna leave. So we really started feeling like, you know, this has been a really cool adventure. And as much as the two of us would love to keep going, you know, year two, Costa Rica, year three, Bali, it wasn't right for them. And as much as we hate to admit it, it just isn't. So kind of like you said, you know, okay, well, what are we going to do next? So the other thing we found too was that moving around from place to place to place to place didn't really allow us the kind of income that we needed to do that sustainably. I know you guys do a lot of um, living in places where I think, I think you call it geographic arbitrage, where it's just cheaper to live a lot of these places so you can make less. Well, we're still living here in America. Things are still pretty expensive. So we and said, okay, the thing fine. is we don't go place to place too often for that reason. Right. It cuts too much time into the billable hours, but yeah, you're right. right. Yeah, exactly. So we ended up feeling really led to settle in Florida. Um, it was kind of out of the blue. I was sitting in church. I'm like, yeah, you know, maybe we need to settle down. And it was like, in Florida. Okay. So here we are. Um, my husband got down here in January. The kids and I were still traveling. We had a rental house on the panhandle. We're like, well, we're not giving that up. We're right across from the ocean. So he came down here to the Orlando area, set up camp, you know, got his job, did all of that. Um, and now I'm here and I'm still freelancing. Mine is more supplementary now. Um, so I'm basically working for all of our future vacations. 
cool. that's where my money goes. It all goes to the vacation fund for the most part because we can live off of what he's making. Um, but one of the ways that we've really incorporated the kids into what we're doing is, um, so obviously we homeschool them and we've pretty much taken an unschooling type approach to their learning. Now unschooling doesn't mean uneducating. It really just means looking at their interests, their skills, um, and seeing what we can do to help them grow who they are and to really help them develop their talents and their strengths rather than saying, okay, you're eight and a half. That means you need to memorize the dates of the American revolution, whatever. Um, so one of the things that has been really um, important in that education is helping them see that there are many, many, many paths to a happy, successful adulthood. It doesn't have to mean college. It doesn't have to mean, you know, you've, you know, dissected a frog or whatever it is. There are lots and lots of ways to be happy and successful. Um, you know, certainly college is great, but we try to tell them, go to college if you have a plan that requires college. You know, don't just go because it's the next thing that you do after you go to high school. Do it because you want to be a doctor and you need to go to med school or whatever it is. So we've incorporated them a lot into the work that we do online and into the services we offer. So Rob has had, I think, two of our kids do voiceover work. Um, wow. my, young, my youngest daughter, Rachel's voice, is the English voiceover for a math app that this guy contracted my husband to have her do. So she's, you know, zero times zero is zero. It's her voice. <laughs> it's kind of fun. That's it's still cool. pretty small time, but it's fun to hear her on there. So she's done that. Um, my other son, Josh, he still has a really young voice. So he's been able to do voiceovers for like people who are looking for boys like eight to 11. And my husband likes playing with the studio equipment and stuff. So, so they've done that. And then, um, my older daughter, who will be 16 in October, um, I started finding projects that I thought, you know, this really isn't my forte, but I bet she could do it. You know, things like um, finding um, Instagram images to meet a particular category or writing, I don't remember what the character limit is, but let's say 135 character tweets. I don't really do Twitter. It's not my thing. But she's on that kind of thing all the time. So I said, I'm going to apply for this job using my reputation do you want to do the job? Well, yeah, because for a teenager, it's good money. And then with this class, with this group um, for the business skills, there's a mastermind group on Facebook. And a lot of the times we'll post jobs for each other. Hey, I found this thing. It's not really my thing, but maybe someone here. And so one of Danielle's um, class members, so to speak, had posted that she needed transcription work done. Now, being, you know, the horrible mother that I am, I made my daughter learn how to type a couple years ago. I said, please just trust me. You know, I'm not usually one to force you to learn anything, but this is a skill that will serve you really well down the road for whatever you want to do. Oh, okay, mom. She did, and she got to the point where I said, Marley, I bet you could do transcription work. That was actually the first online work that I really did, I don't know, 10 years ago. I would get audio files in Spanish, and I would type them in English. You know, do it at home, easy to do. And I thought, she can totally do this. So um, this person in this business girls group posted that she needed transcription work done, and I said, I've got my daughter, Marley. Now, she's brand new. But I guarantee you she'll give you a lower rate than any other native speaker you'll find. She'll do it for $10 an hour. Not audio hour, but $10 you know, per hour of her time. And I said, her time's going to change. She's going to get faster as she goes on and gets used to things. But it's still going to be cheaper than anybody you're going to find you know, that's a native speaker. And fortunately, you know, she decided to take a chance on us. Her client said, yeah, that's fine. And Marley did a fantastic job. And she's thinking, okay. I'm 15. I can go get a cruddy job as a lifeguard and have, you know, other people's kids screaming and, you know, peeing in the pool and I'll make $8 an hour. Or I can sit at home in my pajamas, you know, with my, my water and my whatever and make $10 an hour. You know, so she's Contest. already saying, mom, when's my next job? When can you get me more? So we've really kind of leveraged all of the different skills that we have, all of the different pathways that we've found for work, and really tried to incorporate our kids where possible, where they're willing and able, just so that they have every potential path that they might want to choose as they get older and really say, hey, okay, I'm 18, I need to get out there and do something. You know, I, I'm excited to think that maybe their first thought isn't going to be, well, I better go to college. I'm hoping that their first thought will be, is there something I can do now while I'm trying to decide, is it college or a career or traveling or whatever they're going to do? That's such a good way to do it. I'm so inspired by that. And, you know, like Shannon mentioned, if, if you don't know me at all, our kids are a lot younger, um, eight, seven, and three. 
And so hearing Shan talk about that is super inspiring, inspiring from my perspective because it's considering that blend of, you know, giving them the access to the full buffet of what's on offer so they can choose a path, not saying one's right or wrong, you know, using that to develop that sense of team and collaboration as a family, using it as part of learning, all those types of things, their own independence, their excitement. I'm like so inspired by this stuff. I sometimes actually even mention to my eight-year-old daughter, I'm like, Ah, are you excited to work with mum and dad? Or, you know, like I, I don't push it too much, but sometimes I can't help myself and I'm just like, because I'm so excited about it. And I mean, of course, the, I want the full buffet to be open to them as well. They're not going to be like, you know, um, told that virtual work is the only way to do it. But at the same time, like the other day when my daughter came home and I was, you know, working in Photoshop a little bit and she's like, how did you get that to look like that? And I said, well, would you like me to show you? And she said, yeah, and she made a whole graphic by herself, chose the image on a stock gallery, downloaded it, uploaded it, put the text on, and I was like, yes, this is a win for the Greeson family. <laughs> Do you know what will really start to motivate her? Is what? when there's money, money, when there's money involved, and they can go, wow, you mean if I sit there and do this thing for this amount of time, I can buy a iPod or whatever it is. That's when the gears will really start to turn and go, Mm, yeah, I think I want in on this. Oh, that's so cool. I love that. <laughs> Super inspiring. So, yeah, if you have kids in that older demographic, you know, 10 teenagers or have you, that's something to consider is that, you know, just having that exposure to it, being part of their education, regardless of whether you're homeschooling or not, I think that's so cool. And it's showing people, well, it's showing your kids, you know, that there's that option to go down different routes with it. Thank you so much for everything you've shared, Shannon. This has been like incredibly valuable. Um, I'm so excited to, you know, hear how you guys progress as your journey unfolds over the next couple of years. But the, you know, the first 18 months that I've had the pleasure of being um, a, a casual observer from the outside has been so exciting. Guys, if you would like to, you know, connect with Shannon, find out more about her. Um, of course, if you have, like, if you're an established VA agency freelancer that's looking for someone to reach out to, on behalf of your clients or on behalf of your own business, then of course, Shannon is available or sorry, not always available, but she may possibly be available depending on when you're watching this. So I'll share the links to her websites below this video so you can reach out to her and know where to get in contact with her. Um, but I'll also share the link to her personal blog as well, which is worldwidewatsons.com. That's right, isn't it? I'll share the link yeah, below. That's exactly right. Um, and yeah, really excited to be able to share this with you. Take it and run with it. Implement it either into getting your career off the ground virtually, picking your skill set, going all in, or to leveling up your work volume, your rate, your quality of clients, your enjoyment, your fulfillment, if you're already up and running. Use any, these tips any way you can do that. All right, so good to talk to you. Thank you, Shannon. No problem. It was my pleasure. Thanks. All right, talk soon. Yeah.